Hello, my name is Anne. Now let's join our broadcast as Pastor Earl Wallace and Pastor Mark Brumbaugh explains how the Bible applies to our personal and civic lives. Uh, we're just going to touch on it this week at the end of today's message. Let's uh, read some scripture. The first beast was like a lion with eagle's wings that were plucked. In the first year of Belshazzar, now this is um, going back in time. It's the way the book is, seems to be set up that they show you some uh, history of the uh, Hebrews in, uh, or the, he the, the, he the heroic Hebrews, because as Paul pointed out a couple of weeks ago, there were other Hebrews that were not um, adhering to God's law, and they are participating in these miracles of surviving lions, deaths, and, uh, and uh, fiery furnaces. So this is going back in time a bit. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the son of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and the four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And then the mind of a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. At the end of this chapter, God is going to explain these visions. The Bible explains the Bible as we will see. Bear number uh, beast two is like a hungry bear with three ribs in its mouth. Beast three is like a leopard with four wings and four heads. And behold, another beast, a second one like it, a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked and beheld another, like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. God has another kingdom that's going to rule the world for a while. Uh, Daniel 7, 7 through 8. Beast 4 is different, with great iron teeth, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong had 10 horns but an additional one a little an additional little one uproots three after this i saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong it had great iron teeth it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet it was different from all the beasts that were before it and it had 10 horns. Notice he doesn't liken it to any kind of animal on earth. I considered the horns and behold, there came up upon, among them another horn, a little one. So there actually were 11 horns. Before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. Now there are eight horns. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Daniel 7, 9 through 10, the white-clothed, woolly-haired, ancient of days, reigns from a throne of fiery flames to judge. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair on his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him, a thousand thousands served him, and ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. In Daniel 7, 11 through 12, we see that the horn, that little horn, speaks blasphemies, and the beast body is burned. Now, God is everywhere, always present. So God is actually jumping around in time sequence. He's just given us a glimpse of, of a, probably Revelation chapter 20, near the end of, of what we know is, is of the age when he's going to judge everything. Verse 11, I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. <clears throat> Daniel 7, 13 through 14, the Son of Man is given everlasting dominion. 
I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Daniel 7, 15 through 18, after the four beast kings, God's saints will receive an everlasting kingdom. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the vision of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning these things. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. Daniel 7, 19 through 20. The fourth beast devours and breaks. Now we're going back to the world. The fourth beast devours and breaks uh, and breaks and its feet stamp what's left. The little horn had eyes and a mouth. They're personifying this thing that spoke great things. Verse 19, let's read. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest. Exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn that came up, and before which three of them fell. The horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, that seemed greater than its companions. You notice the horns, or the authorities, the kingdoms are rising out of the beast. Daniel 7, 21 through 22, the little horn makes very big trouble until Christ comes and liberates us to possess his kingdom. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. The fourth beast and the little horn are a dangerously different duo. Thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones. He shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law. And they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and a half time. That's tribulation stuff, which we're going to talk about next week. Daniel 7, 26 through 28. God's court sits in judgment. The saints of the Most High will rule and reign. That's our destiny. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole earth shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed but I kept the matter in my heart. And that's why we're not seeing these prophecies until the end of the book. Daniel's like, this is, this is shaking me up so much, I'm not gonna share it right away. So today we're gonna look at uh, two, of these, two of these four things. God uses Daniel's four beasts to deliver us to our divine destiny. In Daniel 7, one through six and verse 17, we see the history of Gentile kingdoms. They represent three which are animal-like and one which is very, very different. The second thing we're going to look at today is from Daniel 7, 8 through, and then um, Daniel 7, 7 through 8, verse 11, and then 23 to 25. The fourth kingdom is a dangerous, enduring, it hasn't ended, enduring duo of beast and horn. Today, we're just going to touch on number three. The ancient of days will advance his kingdom and judge. And number four, the saints will serve and rule and reign with Christ. We're going to really unpack those next week. First point for today. Here's a prelude to today's message. 
There are three views of interpreting scriptural prophecy. Some of you know I had a phone call last, uh, participated in this so-called Bible study last Saturday night, and I've had discussions, with, I was at a funeral a few months ago, and um, another couple there at dinner was telling me how the Bible's all metaphorical. Well, the Bible's not metaphorical, 90% of it is literal. We saw some metaphors in the first part of Daniel chapter seven, but in the last part of Daniel chapter seven, God explains the metaphors. He explains what the beasts are. So you can look at scripture as if everything's metaphorical, non-literal. You can look at scripture from the historical past, but that's the premise. They say, oh, everything happened in the first century. Or you can have the futurist view, that everything in scripture is going to take place sometime in the future, or at least the, prophet, the prophetic parts, like this, what we're reading in Daniel and Revelation. All right, so let's, uh, let's look at these three different views. The, now, on your notes, we're going to talk about the first three views. Later in the message, we're going to come back and talk about the pew view. Uh, now, the metaphorical view of the Bible and prophecy. Metaphorical, the non-literal view, believe, people who believe this, they believe that scripture is metaphorical. They over-spiritualize everything. They believe the beast is materialism, imperialism, capitalism, aristocracy. But the Bible itself told you in Daniel, no, those are kingdoms. And we're going to talk about those kingdoms. We saw the statue for the past couple of weeks. God is saying, no, this represents literal things that are happening. Can the beast in your life be materialism? Sure, you can go there if you want. I think the church has copped out on the idol worship thing. We've told people for decades, oh, you know, your, your house and your boat and your car, in America, all these things are idols. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says an idol is something that you pray to. And the church has copped out on that. So we have idol worshipers. Idol worshiping people of the fourth beast are running our world. There, this metaphorical view, bullet number three, is independent of the scriptural context. And it deploys a lot of one verse theology. It does a very poor job of seeing how scripture explains scripture. Such as Daniel 19 through 25 explains Daniel uh, 7, 2 through 8. The metaphorical view, here's the worst thing about it, is ignorant that the God who wrote the Bible literally is omnipresent everywhere, always existing, and is unrestrained by time. So he jumps around in time sequence because he's in all those times. Let's look at the historical, the past, and the preterist view of the Bible and prophecy. The Bible historically is both predictive and accurate about how the Catholic Church sought to destroy biblical knowledge, reading, and belief. I think another scholar actually wrote this, this first uh, sentence. So in the, in the early part, the early church recognized that the, the, um, the Antichrist church was the Catholic Church. So those who challenge the historical view, they say, well, the original audience addressed in Scripture, they didn't see any of these future beasts described in Revelation or in Daniel. So the historical fulfillment entirely would be irrelevant to them. They never saw these things happen. Consider the churches Jesus speaks to, this is my rebuttal, consider the churches Jesus speaks to in Revelation 2 through 3. All those churches are in existence at the time when Christ is writing uh, Revelation 2 through 3. The Laodicean church is already there. There's nothing new under the sun, right? Now, the challenge is the historical view, the historical only view, disregards God's eternal perspective. The futuristic view of the Bible and prophecy. Historic, historic, the Bible historically is accurate about how the Catholic church, um, did I? To duplicate a slide, I did in my notes. I hope I didn't duplicate a slide for you. Oh, okay. No, you're right. Stay there. This should be slide 16. Yep. yep. Okay. The futuristic view of the Bible and prophecy. Historically, the people are accurate when they say, hey, the Catholic Church sought to destroy biblical knowledge, reading, and belief. You can see that. The Catholic Church is a kind of a beast. It's an antichrist. The challenge is he uses biblical symbols so people, I'm, I'm so astounded by so, so, so many church scholars, church historians, both past and present, the most famous people we have on the, on the uh, internet, they call the Catholic church the church. It's not, it's not a biblical church. It never was a Christian church. And they, they're always saying, oh, the church went into the dark ages and the church did this. Like, I'm like, no, that was not God's church. 
And we've been deceived by it. And that's why that bestial, bestial system is running everything because people do not recognize it for what it is. So those who challenge this historical view, once again, they say, well, the original audience addressed in scripture didn't see the future beast described in Revelation. So the historical fulfillment entirely would be irrelevant to them. Not true. We haven't seen the fulfillment of Revelation, but the book of Revelation is still relevant to us. Now, debunking the historical view disregards God's eternal perspective. I say we should blend these views. You gotta, it's like both and and. God can walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah. And here's, the, here's, here's what led me to all this. Ecclesiastes 1.9, I think, is foundational to understanding who God is and what we are like. People would say to me, why do we, do we, does every generation keep repeating the same mistakes? I'm like, well, human nature doesn't change, right? Every generation's arrogant. Every generation thinks they know everything. I was like that. Still am in a lot of ways. So we keep repeating the same mistakes. That's why the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 1.9, there is nothing new under the sun. So those who debunk history are deceived about how the C Church, the Catholic Church, has not changed this doctrine, but just its methods of suppressing biblical Christianity. They got that from the Roman government. I'm going to show you that later in the message. All right, so let's review these, uh, these kingdoms. We saw the beast of Daniel 2. They are once again surfacing again in, in uh, Daniel 7. We're going to see uh, at least the, the, uh, the fourth one in Revelation chapter 13. So we, we saw that the golden head was uh, the, the kingdom of Babylon. We saw that the silver chest was the kingdom of Persia. We saw that the brass waist was the kingdom of Greece. We saw that the two iron legs were the kingdom of Rome. And we saw that the iron, the feet, which are um, iron mixed with clay, it's the Roman Catholic Church because God says, he is the potter, we are the... All right, so what this church does, it's, it's, it, the clay is mixed with the feet. So wherever the Catholic Church directs, the clay people are deceived and they're going along with it. All right, now, what we're going to look at next week is that a stone will be thrown down by Jesus at the end of the Gentile age to destroy the Babylonian religious system that has been perpetrated by Roman Catholicism. Let's go on. Here's the puke inclusive view of the Bible and prophecy. It's based on Ecclesiastes 1.9. There's nothing new under the sun. We should rely, we should only uh, look at scripture metaphorically only when the context suggests. We saw in the first part of Daniel 7, there were some metaphors, the beast. But we also looked at the scripture literally at the end of the chapter when God explains what they are. Many metaphors are explained in scripture. Scripture explains scripture. Daniel 7, 2 through 8 is explained in Daniel 7, 19 through 25. When Jesus told parables, the disciples said, but what does that mean? And Jesus explained the metaphors to him, to them. This historical view has relevance, but we must not exclude their future fulfillment. Just because um, some scoundrel in the past put a pig in the Israeli temple does not and sacrificed it on the altar, does not mean that a scoundrel in the future is not going to do the same. The preterist view, they see past history, but they fail to see how the future tends to repeat. There's nothing new under the sun. Now let's just look at one of these, one of how these theories all come up, uh, come out in, in our interpretations of the mark of the beast. Centuries of speculations have said, the mark of the beast, it's the UPC codes, the barcodes, it's microchips, it's your smartphone, it's tattoos, it's vaccines. If you worship, when the Catholic Church changed, the world, uh, when the Rome changed the uh, worship day from Saturday to Sunday, that was the mark of the beast. I think we're still waiting for it. Oh, hey, you know what? All of those could be somewhat related to it. They could be stepping stones to the process, right? All right, let's look at the first beast. Or uh, in part one, uh, in Daniel 7, 1 through 6 and 17, we see a history of Gentile kingdoms. Now, God really only deals with these kingdoms in relation to how they're uh, interacting with Israel. 
They, they're governing Israel's existence. There's, and of these four kingdoms, three are animal-like, and one is very, very different. And you notice that that different one does not get its, get its comeuppance until the end of the age. So the four great beasts came up out of the sea. And people try to make a lot of difference between the sea and the land. I don't know if that's even important. Uh, different from one another. And maybe they come out of the sea because the armies traveled over the sea eventually. I don't know. Now, the first was like a lion. And we also see the, the word sea could be the sea of humanity, right? So the, the four beasts come up out of the sea. They're different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. The second one is like a bear with three ribs in its mouth. Another like a leopard with four wings on its back and then and four heads. All right, let's look at these first beasts. The first beast is a lion with wings and it has the mind of a man. The first beast was like a lion and it had eagle's wings. You know, the symbol of Babylon is a winged lion. And then as I looked, its wings were plucked. Now, here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's the historical um, fact of that. Nebuchadnezzar gets confined. He degenerates to an animal like existence. That's why the lion stands up and acts like a man. He, gets, he enters a seven-year disciplinary period in Daniel 4. And, and it was lifted up from the ground. Right? He's, he's crawling around like an animal. All of a sudden, he gets up. God says, okay, your discipline is done. You've acknowledged me. And he stands on his two feet like a man. And the mind of man was given to it. That's Nebuchadnezzar. We saw that in Scripture, right? This is a metaphor, but we actually saw it literally happen. So Nebuchadnezzar repents, acknowledges, and honors God as a sinful man repenting before his creator. Daniel number four. All right, let's go on to the next one. The second beast is like a bear, but it's raised up on one side like a bear. What's that mean? The Medo-Persian empire, with Persia being dominant, raised up above its Medes, the Medes, its partners. You know, Cyrus, the, the, the Persian, I think, I don't know, what one of his parents was Mede, one of his parents was Persian. So he kind of plays off that. He unites the two kingdoms because he probably can't do all the things, conquer all the things he wants alone. But eventually, you know, the Persians become more dominant over the Medes. It had three ribs in its mouth. What's that mean? Well, Cyrus conquered these major kingdoms, Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. And it was told, arise, devour much flesh. It killed a lot of people. The Persian army under Cyrus at one point was two million men strong. Now, that's a big number by even today's standards. Of course, we see in Revelation the Chinese army is going to have 200 million people or just some conglomeration thereof. All right, look, this map is just showing you the, the map of Cyrus's Persian uh, Empire. We don't, we're not going to go into this, but I just, it's all color code that shows you know his first his first military campaign, his second military campaign, and his third and fourth. Right, so he goes uh, he gets he gets into the he he, he uh, Persia's right here. This is his headquarters. So first he conquers all this, then he conquers this, then he conquers this, and then somehow he gets out here and he conquers that too. So these are great, great, great empires controlling a lot of the world. Next slide. Now the third beast is like a four-headed leopard with wings. This third beast uh, has also has four heads. This is Alexander the Great's Greece. In 10 years, he conquered more territory than did Cyrus in his 30-year career. Now, Alexander died at the age of 32 in 323 BC. That, that date is important only because of what I'm going to show you next. And what he did is they, on his deathbed, supposedly, he said, you know, give my kingdom to the strong. So the four generals divided the kingdom. And uh, Cassandra, Lysimachus, Lys, Lys, whatever this guy says, Lysimachus or uh, Seleucus, but, but the Ptolemies became the, the Egyptians. They, they ruled Egypt. Uh, the last Ptolemy um, ruler was uh, Cleopatra. She was hanging out with uh, Mark Anthony and um, the, uh, the Roman... Uh, um, Caesar went after them and, and, and consolidated his kingdom. But anyway, okay, let's go on. Now, this fourth kingdom is different and exceedingly dangerous and destructive. The fourth beast in the red, it has iron teeth, it tramples and consumes the rest. It has ten horns. Now, the ten horns aren't coming from, from someplace else. The ten horns are coming from the beast. The beast is going to get some kingdoms. It's going to control some kingdoms, like the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. The Catholic Church said to the kings, hey, look it, your power comes from God. I'm God's vicar on earth. And by the way, I don't want anybody reading the Bible. I want you to stamp out those people. Fox's Book of Martyr documents it. 
Fox's Book of Martyrs, okay? It has ten horns, speaks blasphemies against God. You can't pray to Mary. That's a blasphemy against God. When you pray to Mary, you're ascribing that you're saying that she's omniscient, that she's omnipotent, that she can hear thousands and thousands of prayers all at the same time. You're ascribing the characteristics of deity to the of the Trinity to that which is not the, the Trinity and deity. And God calls it violations of Ten Commandments 1 and 2. He calls it blasphemy. Thus the world is entering into the judgment over its blasphemy, thinking that it's actually serving Christianity. Now, just a brief note. Jesus said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, the church. So when, when you read something that says it prevailed, the, the beast is prevailing over the saints, that's revelation stuff. That is the post-rapture church. Because Satan can't prevail against us right now. All right, let's look at the map of the Roman Empire. Pax Roma, that means we're going to bring peace to, to, the, to the world that we control. So Rome may be the largest empire that ever existed. And uh, it was greater than Persia and Assyria. It was, it, it, I should find a relief map and put up what Alexander conquered, because they say they kind of parallel each other, these two great conquerors. But Rome's influence of iron feet overlaid with clay is even way greater than this today. What religion does Joe Biden belong to? Uh, what religion have been the kings of England? Which is a sister of, of Catholicism. Greece, the Greek Orthodox Church. That's really a Catholic church. You read the encyclopedias, they're going to try to tell you that it's, a, it's a, um, a Protestant country, but it's not. They worship Mary, they follow the Pope. They're, they're misleading you. So the, the, the clay, the, uh, the iron with the clay interlaid with the clay feet, the Roman kingdom is even bigger than this today. Next slide. So Rome conquered, and whatever it conquered, it gave you the illusion of local control. I got this from reading some encyclopedias. The Roman Empire came from conquering three ribs, Scandinavian, which was Vandals. They think they came from Scandinavian, which was now modern day Poland. There's question marks there because there's some scholars who you know, disagree with that. They conquered the Huns from the uh, East Asia when they, when they expanded east into, uh, um, when they expanded west from East Asia, they warred with the Germanic tribes in, in, in Europe. And, they, and the tribes even fled westward, and they were trying to escape this Roman onslaught in the 400s, and it became known as the Great Migration. Uh, but they're, 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 when they really consolidated their kingdom was in 30 BC, Octavian, who becomes Augustus Caesar, invaded Egypt. Now, Anthony, Mark Anthony of, um, of uh, Rome had made an alliance with his hottie, uh, Cleopatra, and they were going to get together and try to, you know, they wanted to rule the world. I don't know if they were trying to just ward off Rome or if they really thought we could consolidate our armies and we could defeat and we could conquer Rome, but they lost a major sea battle. And um, then they fled to Alexandria. Now, uh, Alexander the Great, I think he named like 12 towns or cities after himself. So there's Alexandria's all over the place. So they flee to an Alexandria in Egypt. And uh, they both realize they're going to be defeated as, as the army of, uh, of Octavian, who becomes Augustus Caesar, is closing in on them, and they commit suicide. So now Rome has everything. Fourth beast. It's a terrifyingly different duel of beast and horn. Daniel 7.7. 7. After this, behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. Now, Rome, next slide. Wrong. Uh, it, it, this, this is a horrible looking beast. I was tempted not to put up a picture because God doesn't describe it. So who am I to try to find a picture of it? Anyway, all right, but look at the beast. Look at the horn. Guy's got eyes and a mouth. The horn is personified, I believe, as the Pope. What, what does this hat look like? I know we know it's the Dagon fish hat from uh, Jonah, but it looks like looks like a horn, right? All right. So anyway. Rome conquered more territory than uh, any empire before, and it would conduct 25-year sieges. When you enlisted in the Roman army, you enlisted for 25 years. Because that's how long it would take to starve some people out. And they would just build siege works around your, your community, and they would um, uh, uh, block up your water supply, and they would starve you out. So if you enlisted, they said, well, you know, it, it might not take that long. 
but you're signing up for 25 years for that siege. You're signing up for 25 years because we're going to seize this place next, or at the same time. It had great iron teeth, and it devoured in broken pieces, and it stamped with its feet what was left. You're not going to have your culture. You're going to have Roman culture, but we're going to give you the illusion that you have your culture. Rome killed what would not submit, and it stamped out any semblance of the cultures it conquered. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Really, it has eleven horns, right? The little one comes up, and the little one's mouthing off for the rest of the horns. Am I going too fast? Let's go to the next, next slide. So in Daniel 7, 23 through 25, let's look at the characteristics of the Roman Empire, which is explained, which is an explanation of Daniel 7, 7 through 8. The Bible explains the Bible. Scripture explains Scripture. So the fourth beast, it tells us it's a kingdom different from all others. It shall devour. Now, in, in the Aramaic, that word means a cow. Brown driver digs Briggs a uh, um, dictionary. It says this means it eats human subjects. And it's going to devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it into pieces. Out of this kingdom, the beasts, there are ten horns. Ten kings shall arise. And another king shall arise after them. That's the little horn. And he shall be different from the former ones. Why is the little horn different? What's the smallest kingdom on the face of the earth? It's 109 acres called the Vatican. Very different than every other kingdom. You don't even know it's a kingdom. But all the rulers of the world go to the Vatican and bow before the Pope. They bow before the little horn. There's nothing new under the sun, right? Calvin identified it. Zwingli identified it. Uh, Martin Luther identified it. Wycliffe who got burned at the stake. Well, he burned his body in effigy. Uh, and Tyndale. They all identified it. I try to tell Christians all the time. You heard of the Wycliffe Bible translators? Yes. You've heard of the Tyndale Bible Society? Yes. Who are those people? They were people that were burned at the stake by the Catholic Church for promoting the Bible. Trying to put the Bible in a common language. Next slide. Now the ten horns of Daniel 7 will have the characteristics of the ten toes of the feet mixed with clay in Daniel chapter 2. A fourth kingdom, strong as iron, toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. There came up among them a little horn, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. Now that's a really violent overthrow. In this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. This horn is personified as the Pope, speaking blasphemy. The beast gets away with blasphemy because most people don't recognize that it's blasphemy. Most Catholics think it's okay if the Pope changes the Ten Commandments and tells us homosexuality is okay. He's sitting as cathedral. When he sits in his, his magic chair with his tinfoil hat on, somehow you know, he's speaking for God. They don't listen to the Bible. They don't read the Bible. That's why you always hear me now talk about biblical Christianity. Three more slides and a prayer. Rome conquered and allowed the illusion of local control. This is what the historians say. Rome governed by protecting. Now, are, you, are they protecting you if, if you're under a military occupation? Yeah. They're threatening you. Rome governed by protecting. Of course, there could be marauders and other people coming along trying to mess with you. Uh, protecting, military, militarily occupying individual provinces. Guiding each of them to make and administer its own legal ways of complying with Roman dominance and taxation. Hey, look, we'll install a local governor. He could be one of your own people. We just got to find someone that we trust who's going to do things our way in your name. In Egypt, Rome dismantled the Ptolemaic, I don't know how to pronounce that, administrative systems, those are Cleopatra systems, while retaining the veneer of some of its bureaucratic aspects. We'll keep the same offices. This can be occupied. You know what America's doing right now? 
Our offices, our government offices are being occupied by, by Muslims, by people who don't have a biblical value system, who can't swear to the U.S. Constitution because it's based upon a Bible that they abhor. So they created a government that was uniquely Roman but still appeared to be functionally Egyptian or functionally Britain or functionally American. Daniel 7, 25, he shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Why are all these Catholic politicians violating the U.S. Constitution? They have an undisclosed loyalty. A prominent figure in our community told me that he uh, said he went to, a, to the den of iniquity, some kind of Mason meeting, told them no, and he said that within a week my dog was poisoned and died. So in America, it appears our government is unchanged, but our laws and our court rulings have shifted to comply with Rome, the Vatican. Because as my Jesuit college professor told me, he says, Earl, we're going to bring the world under the domination of the Pope. I said, well, how are you going to do that? He goes, we're getting Catholics elected to the school board as we speak. I said, how's that going to bring the world? under the domination of the Pope. He said, are your laws based on the Bible? I said, yes. He said, well, do Catholics read the Bible? I said, they should. He goes, and this is why we're going to win. You think we're something that we're not. Now, I'm going to ask, I asked you a, yes, a, a question to which there's a yes or no answer. Do Catholics read the Bible? And I had to say no. I said, but they should. He goes, uh, uh, uh. just answer the question. No. Okay, then where are, if they get into your government, how are they going to administer your laws? I said, oh, no, you're the smart guy, you tell me. He goes, well, they're going to get it from the Vatican to the cardinals, to the bishop, to the, um, to the local bishop, to their priest. They're going to run America through, through, through their system, not yours. I did not see the danger of it in those days. Why, why are these Catholics calling themselves, if you raped my kid, uh, if you did what they're doing to children in, in, in this church, you would leave this church. Wouldn't you? You wouldn't stay in this church. But they stay in that church. This is not coming, this is not coming randomly. Somehow they've got these people twisted around into believing that we are the one true church. And yes, 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 we may be homosexuals. Oh yeah, we don't believe in marriage. Oh, yeah. and, but, 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 but we're pro-life to a point. And so they have selective morality that, that confuses people into thinking that they have biblical morality. Next slide. We have two more to go. Then a prayer. Part three, we're going to talk about this next week. The Ancient of Days will advance his kingdom despite this. Actually, the Ancient of Days knows this is going to happen. You read Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, and other scriptures. I was reading in 1 Kings, I think it's 1 Kings or 2 Kings chapter 6, the um, Josiah Revival, one of the things Josiah did is he got rid of the male prostitutes out of the temple. He wouldn't let those people go to his libraries and read the children anymore. <laughs> Nothing new under the sun. Daniel says, as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them, but he's not going to prevail over the ancient of days. He may prevail over the, uh, the, the post-rapture saints. Remember in Revelation chapter 10 or 13, I think it is, there's two witnesses, right? They kill them. They lie in the street for three days. They prevail over the saints. But we're going to possess the kingdom. Last slide. We're going to talk about this next week. As saints, we will serve and rule and reign with Christ. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heavens, heaven shall be given to the people of the saints. I believe that we had some opportunities when God made the United States of America. When people asked Ben Franklin, what did you give us? He said, a republic, if you can keep it. Well, we didn't know. We lost what it was founded upon, and we haven't kept it. Can we get it back? I don't know. I do know that this is the truth. We've got to keep working towards God's truth, not towards man's mess. So let's pray this prayer. Lord, we thank you for your amazing word that tells us what was, what is, and what will be. Thank you for showing us there is nothing new under the sun and how we are to repent and go about fixing things that are wrong. As a nation, we have failed to uphold your commandments and have been under your discipline for this iniquity. 
Give us grace to humble ourselves, pray, seek your face, and turn from our wicked ways. So hear from, you hear from heaven, forgive our sins, and heal our nation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for watching. We hope you will join us in fulfilling 2 Chronicles 7.14 by repenting and turning to righteousness through Jesus Christ so God heals our land. For more information about how the Bible applies to every aspect of life, including civics, visit us at libertycfchurch.org. You can mail us at P.O. Box 235, Latham, New York, 12110.